Good evening. Pastor Bob here. This is our Wednesday evening sessions, and we've been going through a series uh, that I've just entitled Engaging the World with the Truth of Scripture. Tonight is going to be one of those interesting ones in which we consider a point uh, that I've discovered in Revelation chapter 17. Now, don't get worried. We're not going to do a study of the book of Revelation. We're doing that every other Tuesday. But I came across this passage as we were going through our studies, and I saved it for this moment because it really pricked my interest. So we're going to read Revelation 17, starting in verse 1 in a moment, but let's pray together first. Father, you have been our God, our all-consuming passion, the love of our life, the director of our steps, the Lord of our lives. As we come to your word tonight, Father, I pray you will direct our steps, that you will order up our lives, and that we will be obedient to you, Father. So open our hearts and minds to your word, Lord. Teach us by the power of your spirit, and then, Lord, help us to be obedient, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation 17, beginning in verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the mar martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Now, this isn't going where you think it might be going. But that passage got me to thinking about the subject of who are the designated drivers on the highway of life? That is, of course, what we read in Revelation 17, a picture from the end times of prophecy of what will happen to the enemies of God. The prostitute mentioned here has a direct connect and influence on mankind. I believe this woman is figurative of commercial Babylon, the great enticer of men's hearts, which got me to thinking, if mankind is drunk with the intoxicating influence of this world's delights, who is their designated driver? In other words, who will be the sober and responsible party to ensure the safety of those inebriated people who have lost their sense of reason and are subjected to diminished capacity both physically and mentally? Well, the answer is obvious. The redeemed of the Lord will be the ones who do it. Now, this woman in Revelation 17 hearkened me back to the, the uh, thoughts alongside each other in the book of Proverbs about wisdom as opposed to the forbidden woman who stands on the street corner, who always is beckoning you to, uh, to, uh, to avoid wisdom and go pursue her. In Proverbs 22, 14, it says, The mouth of forbidden women is a deep pit. He with whom the Lord is angry will fall into it. So all that got me to thinking. I looked up the definition of intoxication. The condition of having physical or mental control markedly diminished by the effects of alcohol or drugs, an abnormal state that is essentially a poisoning. So I got to thinking, all right, if the world is intoxicated <coughs> with the beverages, what kind of beverages might those be? Well, first of all, you need to know the world's, uh, all mankind's in two parts. One part we might call the world. The other part we'll call the redeemed of the Lord. The world are all those people who have not put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what the people of God are, are told about this. In 1 John 2, 15 to 17, do not love the world or the things in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Given in this passage are three intoxicating agents. 
The people of the world frequent a saloon which, which only has three drinks. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This passage provides us with the disturbing behavior caused by consuming the three drinks. What is important for us to remember is that the redeemed of the Lord were once like that. They were once enticed away, inebriated, drunk with the wiles of the world. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-11, through 11, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice sexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to these words. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So we have people in the world, and the people in the world is how we all come when we're born. We're all intoxicated away by those three drinks, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. But there are Christ-redeemed people in the world also. Listen to Peter in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that if you can't keep things like the Ten Commandments, which are the laws of God written down on tablets of stone, what in the world makes you think, since you can't keep those, that you can keep anything else that's deserving of getting into heaven? In verse 11, Galatians 3, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's Matthew five thirteen to 16. So there's something at play here in the community of mankind, and it is the devil himself. You know, he's the one who has inspired, motivated, and empowered this great prostitute, the things that go on in the world. But how does he work? How does the devil work in defeating man? Well, I want to give you six things. The first one is he works by deception or by blinding men's eyes, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Secondly, he works by enslaving people or entrapping people, Romans 6.16. 6, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness? Third, lying. You are of your father the devil, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He also works by hypocrisy. 
By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother, 1 John 3.10. And this very interesting statement in 2 Corinthians 11.14, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's not uncommon, it's all entirely common to see Satan's guys, Satan people, uh, full of hypocrisy because he is. And then rebellion or lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will come, not come, unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit, uh, and a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Do you see his work? When Satan is bound up, there is no rebellion. There is no lawlessness. Why? Because the great tempter has been chained up. In Revelation 20, verse 7 Listen to the other side of this story. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth. So Satan is big in rebellion and lawlessness, and he creates that in the community of mankind. 1 John 3, 4, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And sixth, the devil works in the community of man by creating this willfulness and stubbornness. 1 John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Willfulness. All this time, Satan's been beating the same drum. All this time, he's been stubbornly unable and refusing to repent before God. Now, he's an eternal being, and he can't because he made an eternal choice when he rebelled against God. But he stirs up this willfulness and this stubbornness among men to cause them to rebel against God also. Well, the good news for those redeemed in Christ is that Christ made us sober. In 1 John 3, verses 1 through 10, we see that, that Christ appeared to destroy the works of Satan, as I just read. And how are those works of Satan destroyed? Well, in two stages, really. The first is that the Son of God appeared and died for our sins so that they can be washed away and the devil can no longer accuse us or discourage us with them. And secondly, we are born again. We are born of God. We have to have the eyes of our hearts open so that we can come into the light and see things the way God does and agree with God about the beauty of his holiness and the ugliness of our sins and the surpassing value and greatness of our Christ. When that happens, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin and the works of the devil are destroyed. So let's talk about this new birth. Anybody can sin who wants to sin. So when John says that a person born of God cannot sin, he must mean that a person born of God has new wants, new desires. It's like a birth. Something new has come into existence. Paul calls it a new creation in Ephesians 2.10, 4.24, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Jeremiah calls it a new heart, Jeremiah 24.7. Ezekiel calls it a new spirit, Ezekiel 36.26. Being born of God is being changed by God so that the dominion of sin is broken. We are transferred from the domain of darkness into the dominion of light and by our glorious Savior. Verse 9 of uh, 1 John 3, verses uh, 1 through 10, verse 9 says that when a person is born of God, God's seed abides in him. That's why he cannot sin. The image is taken from ordinary human birth. When a father begets a child, the father's seed abides in the child. Something of the father is in the child, and it makes him like his father. God's character is the very opposite of sin. Therefore, the child of God will be like his father, 
he will not be able to sin. And how about walking in the light? Walking in the light doesn't mean that you are sinless. It means that you see sins now in God's light and respond to them the way God does. Again, in verse 9, it's clear. It's a clear parallel to verse 7, and it teaches us this. If we confess our sins, that corresponds to if we walk in the light, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That corresponds to the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all sin. A person who walks in the light confesses sin. That means he sees sin the way God does and agrees with God. He hates sin. He's sorry for sin. He turns and flees from known sin. When sin is pointed out in his life, he does not bristle with self-righteousness. He confesses. He admits. He repents. Walking in the light means having your eyes open to the truth about God and sin and Christ. 1 John 5, 4 says, Whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. The way to participate personally in Christ's victory over the world and the works of the devil is by trusting Christ, believing he is the very Son of God, and with all that that implies about his power and his work for your good. So we are now the designated drivers to help the world safely home. First of all, we are awake now and we are sober. Luke 21, verses 34 to 36. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come about all who dwell on the face of the earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prows, prows, hmm, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So we are to be awake and sober. And then our conduct comes into play here. Matthew 13, verse 11 through 14. Or excuse me, Romans 13, verse 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for, to you for, for you to wake up from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Ephesians 5.18 And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So we are to be awake and sober, and our conduct is such that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to walk properly as in the light, and we're not supposed to make any profession of provision for the flesh in our conduct. But then we have a mission. It's a mission of reconciliation. It's, not, it's, what, it's one thing to walk in the world as children of the light. It's one thing to walk in the world and be awake and sober. But it's another thing to see that we have a mission that involves being awake and sober and also involves our conduct to be children of light. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made, made him who knew no sin, uh, to, be, to be sin rather, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Colossians 4, 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. 1 Peter 
3, 15 to 16. But in your hearts honor Christ as ho- the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So we have been given a ministry, a mission of reconciliation from God. So we are to be awake and sober. We are to conduct ourselves following Christ, walking in his steps. And we are to take up the ministry which Christ himself had in reconciling the world to himself. And then we are to make disciples. This is the process by which we do that. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Jude's warning in Jude 22 and 23 is not to be like the world, but be like those who walk out into the world and bring back those who are defiled in the flesh. James 5.20 My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Proverbs 11.30 The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Matthew 4.19 And he, that's Jesus, said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And of course, here's our mandate from our Lord in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Our task is clear, to be in the world, but not of it. The night that he was betrayed, Jesus prayed for us, And listen to what he prayed specifically for us. In John chapter 17, Jesus said these words, beginning in verse 14. I have given them, he's praying to the Father here. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for what purpose, you might say? Why did Jesus pray that we wouldn't be taken out of the world? Why did Jesus pray that we would be kept from the evil one? Why did Jesus pray that we would be in it but not of it? What purpose? The answer is the same as his. To seek and save, to be light and salt, to help them when they are helpless, to deliver them safely home. My brothers and sisters, this is really kind of a backdoor way to talk about evangelism, but you need to see this, I think, the way it just hit me first. And that is the world is drunk with the things of this world, and they are unable to get themselves safely home. It's our task, our job, our glorious calling to go into the world and to snatch them out of this troubled world into the glorious truth and light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are the designated drivers for the world. So we must take our task seriously. Let's pray. Father, help us to hear this lesson today. Help us, Father, to see the people in the world are unable to help themselves. Someone must go and tell them. Someone, Father, must be able to help get them home. Lord, we don't save anybody. Your spirit saves people. But you do use us. The voice that people hear with the gospel is our voice. The gospel lived out is our lives. And Father, we must be taking this task seriously, especially, Lord, when the days are growing increasingly wicked, where there's violence and rebellion on every hand, where sexual immorality and immorality of all kinds are running rampant through our culture, Father. Our culture needs designated drivers to deliver them from their drunkenness to a place of safety. Help us, Lord, to be that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, dear ones. Have a good evening.